here for today. I just want to be encouraging everybody to be reading the Bible. I know that uh, the, the really cool thing about the summer is that like the weather is really, really awesome. And sometimes when that happens, unfortunately, we neglect to go back into our Bible. And so if you guys have ever seen the movie War Room, it's an awesome movie. Uh, but here, uh, one of the actors uh, from the, the movie War Room, uh, she says, read the Bible each day. Let the Word of God mold you into a person of prayer. And so it's really important that in our life we're able to spend time reading the Bible. Because the more that we read the Bible, the more we understand what God wants for us. Our life no longer becomes what we want, but instead it starts to look a little bit more identical to how God has created us to be, which is in the image of God. And that only comes if we're spending time in the Word of God. And so not only do I want you to be able to understand the Word of God by reading the Word of God, but today's sermon, you have to actually apply it. You have to actually do something with today's message. And so here it says, someone once asked Billy Graham, if Christianity is valid, why is there so much evil in the world? So to this, Mr. Graham replied, with so much soap, why are there so many dirty people in the world? Christianity, like soap, must be personally applied if, if it is to make a difference in our lives. So yeah, like there's a lot of dirty people out there, but there's also a ton of soap out there, right? Okay? And so because of this, it's really important that as Christians, we are able to apply the Word of God into our life. It's just like soap. If you don't apply it, it's not going to make any difference whatsoever. And so this is something that we need to do. So today's comic, it says, so that's the first 10. Who's up for the next like 603? So if you guys can't tell, that's Moses, okay? And so Moses has come down the, the mountain. He's got his Ten Commandments. But they just don't know that there's more laws and more commands coming at them. All right? And so for uh, this entire summer, our summer sermon series, it is the book of Galatians. And so today we are on part four or the fourth sermon of our sermon series Today's sermon titled, it is titled, A Child of God. And so the sermon question that I've asked myself is, do you know that you are loved so much by God the Father? And so this is a question that uh, perhaps maybe you've asked yourself recently as well. Do you know that you are loved so much by God the Father? There's a lot of things that's happened in our life, and sometimes we feel that God is no longer there, that God no longer loves us, He has abandoned us, and we feel really broken. We feel very hurt. And God is supposed to be this loving Father, but yet through all of our brokenness, we feel like we're so distant from God. And when that happens, there's a lot of brokenness, emptiness, heartache in our life. And we feel that we're not loved. And so today, my question for you is, do you know that you are loved so much by the Father? And so if there's only one thing that you can take away from today's sermon, it's really simple. I want you to know that, yes, you are a child of God when you believe in Christ Jesus. And I believe that every single one of us here in this room today, we're all here because we're Christ believers. We're Christ followers. And when that happens, you've been adopted into a new family. And this is the family of God. And you have a new father. And that new father loves you with all of his heart. And so to remind us, the book of Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul to the churches in the province of Galatia in the Roman Empire. And not only that, but when you take a look at the book of Galatians, 
It's a very quick and easy read. There's only six chapters in that. So today, we're on chapter four. So to get us started, I wanted to kind of throw this question out there for all of you. Tell me what it was like when you held your child for the first time in your arms. For some of you, it's very recent. For some of you, it's been maybe a few decades. And for some of you, okay, like, it might be your first time holding someone else's child, and that's okay, all right? All right, so what was that experience like for you guys holding your own flesh and blood for the first time? What was that like? What do you guys got? Cheryl? Uh, a lot bigger than I could ever describe. Okay, all right. Like, words are really hard to describe what that feeling is like, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mary? I was like in awe, like, I actually, this is, you actually grew inside me, I, I created you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like, wow, this thing actually came from me somehow, right? Okay. All right, what else? What else? How was that experience like for you guys? Okay, yes? All and wonder. All and wonder, right? Okay. Dale. I, w I was struck by the that all in the small package there was so much packed up. Eye color, personality, things that I would go to know. Some things I'd really like, some things I might not. Uh -huh. I felt intimidated. Um, <laughs> uh, just uh, awe is, is certainly one of those sorts of things. Yeah. I'm just amazed that everything is in this package. Yeah. And it all you know, started nine months earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. And that little package, it's no longer a little package, but the amazing <laughs> thing is there are so great things happening through that larger package today. Yeah? Well, and lastly, it's going to, it was a whole lot easier when the package was being carried by Julie <laughs> than it is outside. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The responsibility. Yeah. Finally, hate you. Oh yeah, it's a great weight. I mean, you know, like you're you're in all of just the entire moment, but yet it's this wave of just responsibility. Like this, this little thing can't take care of itself, and it's my wife and I that we're going to determine what this precious life is going to be like. Right? Okay, Yvonne. For me, it was very shocking. Okay. Because I was expecting one and got two. All right. <laughs> so you got a double package, yeah, right? Yeah. Right. In fact, two I for the price of one. In fact, I even told them the boy wasn't mine <laughs> <laughs> because I went to 48 hours of straight labor, so they had to knock me out for the second one. Sure. <laughs> and they brought. This boy, and I said, he's not mine. I said, yes, he is. Oh. Ted, right? Ted? Oh. Okay. Same. They were only one pound. Oh, okay. Oh, the girl was one pound, the boy was one pound. All right. Four ounces. Okay. Same. Um, when you finally, when you see a whole little world in your hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes, for sure. So, you know, as parents, we love our little babies unconditionally. And, and, I mean, when I talk about babies, I'm talking about when they were babies. Like, but, you know, like, even as, you know, we talk about these bigger packages, they're still our babies, right? Like, it doesn't matter if they're an adult. T to us as parents, we always still view them and see them as our precious little babies. Vicki? I'm Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, so we tell our children that we love them and that we will never want them to forget that, right? Okay, so in everything that we do each and every day, the reason why we cook for them, the reason why we take care of them, the reason why we go through these things is because we love them and we never want them to forget that. And so I remember the first time that I held my child in my arm for the first time, and that was Kennedy. That was back on November 28th of 2007. Um, Kennedy was a C-section. And so like, you know, like you kind of thought that he was going to enter the world, 
a, a different way, and then C-sections make things a little bit more differently, and all of a sudden, like, you know, she got cut and he pretty much just kind of popped up, right? Okay? And so that was just really amazing and really cool to see that, like, somehow God was able to put my wife and I together to, to create this precious little child. And, you know, I don't think you have to say it out loud, but in my heart, I pretty much said, you are my child and I'm going to love you and I'm going to do whatever I can to protect you and to make you into the wonderful person that God has formed you to be. So the same love that you have for your children is also the same love that God has for us since we are children. But sometimes, like, but, you know, like if you want to times that by like a gazillion. So you love your children. I love my kids. And, and that's like... You know, sometimes we use love in so many different ways and it's really difficult for us to express that love that we have for our kids. But the love that God has for us, I mean, that's like unimaginable how much he loves you. Because the reality is this. You, you didn't create this child yourself. I mean, it was conceived between you and another person. But after that, God did the rest of the work. God was the one that molded this precious baby. And so because he molded this, molded this child into life, God created that. God created you and I so carefully with his hands. And because of this, he loves you so much beyond anything that you can ever imagine. But unfortunately, sometimes the older that we get, the less we remember God's love for us. And that is so true because we, after a while, we get old. And sometimes, depending on the relationship that we have with God, it becomes distant. And when we become more distant from God, we forget how much God truly loves us. And so because of this, we're going to be examining the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. And in that Bible verse, it says... But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. So... To get us started with that Bible verse, we're going to be taking a look at the first couple of words. But when the right time came. So God's timing, it is always perfect. God, he, he's got it all figured out. He's got it all planned out. It may not be the timing that we want, but it's the timing that we need. And so because of this, we need to trust in him. In our own little world, you and I, we think that we've got a perfect timeline about how life should be. Maybe in high school you thought, this is going to be the perfect career. This is going to be that perfect person that I am going to marry. And, and, and these are going to be the perfect children that I'm going to have. Well, the reality is all those things that you had planned for when you were younger, or even today, your future plans, they never work out the way that we have it planned. And the reason why is because it's really simple. Sometimes what we want is not what God wants. And thank goodness that everything that we ask for, God does not allow those prayers to be answered. Am I correct with that? Yes. Yeah, because can you imagine if everything that you've always wanted, that everything that you pray for, it would just come true? Imagine what your life would be like today. You might not even be in the presence of God. You might have walked away from him so long ago. How many times have we ever wondered, boy, if I could just win the lottery. Well, look at all the people that have won the lottery that after that, their lives are more broken because they've been able to obtain all of this wealth. So what God has planned for us and when he's got that plan is so much more perfect than what you think is your perfect time. 
And everything in life happens for God's perfect timing. Your birth is not an accident. And so, I, as, as a pastor, I get to talk to a lot of people. And sometimes when I talk to people, I talk to broken people. And sometimes these people tell me, Pastor, I wish I was never born. That really breaks my heart. Because the reason why they feel like they're in so much misery is because they're here on this earth. If only God would have kept them in heaven and never delivered them here to earth, if they would have never been alive, they would not be experiencing the grief, the misery, the depression, all these different feelings and sometimes negative of the life. And so they have regrets like, you know, why am I even here? And so I want all of you to know that your birth and your presence right now in this room, it's not an accident. God did not make you an accident. God never makes an accident. Because if God makes an accident, God would be at fault. And God is perfect. God doesn't make any mistakes. Some of you guys have been in relationships that have just been broken up. And because of this, uh, you know, like, you're just really, really mad at the relationships that you have. And I just want you to know that God's got his perfect timing for that relationship. And I know that we have some younger people in this room that are going to be looking for that perfect soulmate or that perfect relationship. And I just want you young people to know that there is no such thing as a perfect spouse, a perfect relationship, a perfect marriage. These relationships are a constant work in progress. And so in God's perfect timing, God's going to allow that person to come into your life. And they're not going to be what you expected. But again, not your will, but God's will for you. And so all these relationships, it's according to God's time. Some of you guys recently, maybe even through COVID, have lost your job or lost some income. And so because of this, you don't know what to do. But I want you to know that God's got a perfect time for everything. And the really cool thing is, sometimes God allows one door to be closed in order so that you can walk into a new door. And that new door can be even more exciting, more better than that old door. Some of you guys, unfortunately, have also spent some time incarcerated. And so at my time at the Marathon County Jail, when I spent time with these inmates, I talked to some really humble inmates. And instead of being really mad at the justice system, instead of being really mad at law enforcement, some of these individuals that I have talked to, they've humbled themselves to say, you know what, Pastor Yao? I am so happy that I am locked up right now. Because if I wasn't locked up, I would be running in the streets, I would be doing things that I shouldn't be doing, and perhaps I would even be dead at this point. Being incarcerated has saved me so that I can be alive, so that I can have a reset in my life, so that when I get out, I can hopefully make better choices than what got me into here. Some of you guys have uh, faced health issues, and because of this, they, this can take a toll on you. And you're like, God, why does this have to happen? And I can tell you, through these different trials and tribulations related to our health, if we humble ourselves, we realize that, you know, I need God to be my healer. And perhaps this has gotten you closer to the Lord. And I know that especially through my Achilles surgery that I've gone through, uh, through this difficult procedure and, and health experience, it's made me realize how fragile life is, how fragile our body is, but it's also made me realize how much I need God to be the healer in my life. Unfortunately, some of you guys have also experienced death in your family, and so that's never good uh, because it brings us to a really dark place. But I also know that sometimes through death, God is able to make that into a blessing. And so we consider that a blessing in disguise. And I just know that for some of the, the people that I have met recently, 
Um, you know, especially in hospice, that can just be really burdening uh, to be able to, to take care of this individual, whether that's going to be a few months or a few years. That can be a great burden. Um, and because of this, you're constantly with that person, trying to take care of that person, which doesn't allow you to sometimes take care of yourself. And after a few months or a few years, uh, that could just take a, a big detrimental impact on your own physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. And so God sometimes allows these things to happen um, because it's his perfect timing. So no matter what difficult circumstance that you have gone through, you have to put your complete trust in God alone. So we call life a great roller coaster because there are times where life is good, and then there are times that we face lots of challenges. And because of this, God's got it all figured out. And this is the reason why in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. We feel that sometimes these difficulties, these challenges, the pain that we experience in our life, we feel that sometimes God is doing this because he doesn't like us, or it's a punishment, or God is out to get us. And it's never like that. Because sometimes through these greatest struggles come some of the greatest blessings in our life. I believe that pain trains. This pain that you and I have gone through, whether it's a relationship, whether it's related to your economics, whether it's related to your body, your relationships, uh, jobs, or whatever, I truly believe that all these pains in our life, it trains us to truly be dependent, not upon ourselves, but instead be dependent upon the Father. And unfortunately, sometimes our biggest pain can come from our family. I want to just put this out there. And how many of you guys can probably say, Amen. Sometimes the biggest pain comes from those that we love the most. Sometimes our greatest pain comes from those that are supposed to love us the most. And sometimes that doesn't happen. So just to share a personal story with you guys. So I grew up here in Wausau, and in 2000 I graduated from Wausau West High School. And I knew Mela for a month and a half, and I was not planning on it, but I got married a month and a half after I graduated high school. So that fall, I left home and I went to college. And then a year later, September 11th happened. And in 2002, I signed up for the Army. And then in 2003, I went down to Fort Benning, Georgia for training. So I, I left Mela and my family here in central Wisconsin to go and train to be a combat infantry soldier. And then from 2004 to 2005, I was deployed to Iraq. And so by the time I came back from Iraq, it's been five years, and half of that time, I was only with my wife, and now minimally, I was barely with my family. The picture that you see there, that's my family. And we lived over by Marathon Park in that house. So that was the house that I lived in high school. And so I had many fond memories of, doing, of me doing great things with my family in that house. Well, after I got married, I left that house. And then by the end of 2005, you know, I kind of finally came back to that house and I wanted to make more memories with my family. And then two years later, in 2007, I graduated from college finally. And I kind of said to myself, all right, I'm no longer living in Stevens Point. I'm going to come back to live in Wausau. And when I'm going to come back to live in Wausau, I feel like I have kind of distanced myself so far from my family because I was at college and then I was in the army and then I was in Iraq. And now that I'm finally graduated from college, I'm going to come back to Wausau and make more, more memories with my family. Well, a few months after that, my parents announced to me that 
They were no longer going to be moving, uh, they were no longer going to be living in Wassa, but they were now going to be moving to Oklahoma. And I just thought, like, why are you guys doing this to me? I was so very mad at God because, like, like in 2005, I almost died in Iraq. And I, I just feel like for being a 24-year-old, I didn't have enough memories with my family. Um, and the, the cool thing is, as you mature, you realize how precious time with family is. And it took God taking me to Iraq for me to realize that family is really important and I need to spend more time with my family. So when I came back from the war, I said, I'm alive and now I get to make more memories with my family. But then my parents announced to me that they were going to be moving to Oklahoma. And I got really, really mad at my parents because I said, I just moved back into town now after being gone for so long. Why are you guys ditching and leaving me now? And I felt abandoned. And yes, I blamed my parents, but even beyond that, I was really mad at God because it's like, God, why are you taking my parents, why are you taking my younger siblings away from me? I want to spend time doing things with them. And so I was really, really upset at God. I felt like God didn't love me. And you could only imagine the brokenness of a son or the brokenness as, my, as a brother when I saw their vehicle driving off that driveway for the last time, leaving me behind. That was back in 2007. Now in 2020, I can reflect upon that experience, how bitter, how angry I was at God, and I thought nothing good could ever come from my parents ditching me here in Wausau all by myself. But something good did come from that. You see, uh, in the Hmong culture, when you marry your wife, as a son-in-law and as a son, I have a, a, I have a big responsibility to take care of my in-laws, and I have a big responsibility to take care of my parents. And when my parents were still living here for that short time, it was really difficult to, uh, to please uh, my side of the family, but also to, to please my in-laws. And, and you just feel like you're so busy doing all these things for them, and I never had time to do things for myself or to do things for God. But the really cool thing is, God took that big responsibility away from me with taking care of my parents when they went down there because I could no longer physically take care of them. And it was during that time that God set it to work in my heart to say, yeah, because you have a little bit more time now, I want you to think about starting up a church. And so... The cross would have never started if I was too busy trying to take care of my parents and my in-laws. And so today, that's the blessing in disguise. I thought, like, this is the worst thing that can happen to a son for his parents to abandon him. But many years later, I've come to realize God taught me greater lessons in that, okay? In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. God is not out to get you. God doesn't bring tragedy, trials, and tribulations into your life because he hates you. Nah. God actually brings these things into your life because he loves you. And it is through these difficult challenges we have to learn to say, it is no longer I that is in control. I can't do this, God. I am no longer in control, but I am going to surrender, me, myself, and I, and I am going to let you now be the pilot in my life. Because I've been trying at this for too long, and it hasn't been working. And that's the reason why you're going through some of the mess that you are going through. Because you think you've got it all figured out when you don't. And we're never going to get it all figured out. 
but God's got it all figured out. So what we have to do is we have to let go of our ego, thinking that I know what's best for me, and say, God, I know nothing about what's good for me, because you and I know, left to our own selfish desires, just like the kid said this morning, it is so much more easier for us to do bad and sin. And that's the reason why God allows these things to happen so that we can start becoming that much more dependent on Him because He's got it all figured out. Amen. Continuing on in Galatians, it says that God sent His Son born of a woman. And so sometimes we think, God doesn't understand my struggles. God doesn't know what it means to be in this life. God doesn't understand me. God's like somewhere else and he has no idea what's happening in my life, the struggles that I'm going through. And I want you to know that that's incorrect thinking. Amen. How can you say that God doesn't understand you? Because Jesus came into this world like the rest of us. Jesus didn't just one day magically pop in the world and say, I'm Jesus and I'm perfect. I am this adult. I've got it all figured out. No, Jesus was born like you and I into this world. He came through a mother. He was a child. So we experience all these different emotions that you and I, as a human being, that we experience today. He understands because he was like us. God ain't some high, mighty God that somewhere else and he doesn't care about you. No. He went through the same experience, the same trials, the same challenges that you and I are going through today. But the cool thing is, he was perfect through all of that. And that's what we need, is Christ's perfection. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 15, it says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So the Bible says, don't you think for a second here that God just had all the power to just overcome everything. Ah, he had to go through the same trials and tribulations, temptations that you and I went through too, because he was man just like you and I, but he was also God. So there's an element of God that makes him human, and because he was human, he was also susceptible to these different temptations. Continuing on with Galatians, it says that um, subject to the law. And so when it talks about subject to the law, these are talking about obviously like the Ten Commandments, which were the law, but the Jewish laws, there was even more. And this is the reason why I had that comic before. I remember, remember Moses said, hey, are you ready for the Ten Commandments? Plus, I've got like 603 more. Because for the Jewish people, yeah, like they, they had to follow the Ten Commandments. But as time went on, there were all these rigid Jewish laws for them to also follow. So continuing on, it says, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 10, it says, It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. God loves us so much, but because God is so perfect, God is so pure, God can't stand to be in the sight of sin. Well, you and I, when we take a look at our life, there's a lot of sin. There's a lot of filth. There's a lot of dirtiness and grime. And because he is so perfect, he has to separate himself from us. And that's what sin does in our relationship with God. We can't be connected to God because of our life immersed in sin. So in order for that relationship to be reconnected, we have to let go of the sins that keep on separating us from God. Because of our disobedience to God and sins, 
We turn away from God and instead we belong to Satan. Our sins made us a property of Satan. Because sometimes, like the children said, it's easier to do bad than it is to do good. And when that happens, it's easier for us to follow Satan instead of following God. And when that happens, we become a slave of Satan. Living a life of sin no longer feels bad. It becomes the new normal. What used to be sinful is now acceptable. What used to be something that you would never say, do, or think becomes the new you. And that's a very dangerous place to be at. If we're not careful, what you and I used to shun, what you and I used to stay away from, if we're not careful, the devil has his way of coming into our life and twisting our heart, twisting our mind to say, that's okay if you do that. That's okay if you say that. That's okay if you believe that. And so then we start living a life that is controlled by Satan. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. But through the course of time, we start to stray away from God and we start to follow Satan instead. We become controlled by him instead. There are so many things in the world back then that used to be sinful, but today it's widely accepted. Now, I can give you guys so many different examples that we can be here all day. But we have some older folks in this room. And you guys have seen how, as time goes on, maybe whether that was 20 years ago or 50 years ago, back then, what would have been totally unacceptable, something that we would have never done, something that we would have never thought about in 2020, it's like the new normal. It's totally okay. Everyone's doing it. Everybody says, that's okay. And when we have to be really careful. When we start to accept some of these worldly things, like, it's okay. I guess if everybody's doing it, it must be okay. And like, I'm old school. And so I, I just believe that there's great reasons as to why whether it was 10, 20 years ago, why, why was it that our parents said that? They had good reasons for that. Why was it that our grandparents did those things? It was for good reasons. And those good reasons are to help us so that we're following God's ways so that we're not going to stray away from His Word. And, and you guys know the way of the world today. And it's really sad, but some of, the, some of the beliefs that would have never been accepted 10, 20 years ago, today, you're going to get heckled and made fun of if that's what you believe in. And so we have to stand our ground as believers to say, no, I am not going to believe in what the world wants me to believe, but my belief comes in the word of God. And God's word still stands today in 2020, just like how it stood many thousands of years ago. And that word is the gospel. And so all of that changed on the cross when we believed that Jesus paid for all of our sins. And so yes, we used to live a life of sin, but Jesus Christ, came, he came on the cross to die for our sins. And because of this, we have all been redeemed. There were all these laws that we had to follow, like those Jewish laws. And when Jesus came to die on the cross for all of our sins, he says, my blood has paid for all the sins of the world. My blood, my life is good enough. And so you don't have to follow in all those gazillion laws anymore but I have already come to redeem you. So follow me, believe in me. And you don't have to follow all these rigid hundreds of Jewish laws anymore. I've already paid for them all. And when you do that, the Bible tells us that you now become a child of God. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. 
So that spirit that he talks about, it is the spirit of God. And the spirit of God lives in all of us as believers. And that is the reason why here at the cross, this is a family. And the reason why is because we all have one father. And all of us are his children. Why are we his children? Because we're united in one way. And that's because we have Christ Jesus in our heart. And when that happens, God says, when you accept my son as your savior, you're now adopted into my family. And so when I look at all of you, I don't see a black man, I don't see a white man, I don't see a Mexican man, I don't see a Korean man. I don't see those skin colors whatsoever. But instead, I see all of us as children of God. And God has blessed this world with beautiful colors. And that's it. But deep inside, we all have one Savior, and that's Christ Jesus. Because there's only one Father in this world, and that's our Heavenly Father. Jesus spoke Aramaic back during those days. And so obviously we're not used to hearing the word Abba, but in Aramaic, that's what they said. Uh, that's their version of Papa or Daddy. And so when you pray, you can't say Abba, Father. You can't say, hey, Daddy, hey, Papa, up in heaven. It's me, your son. It's me, your daughter. That's the relationship that God wants from you, is you are his child. And so he wants you to reach out to him. You know, like, I don't know about you guys, but the words that could probably melt my heart the most is daddy. And the reason why I say that is because by the time your kids come to you and say, daddy, or mommy, it's because there's something that they can't do. And you can do that for them. And in our life today, there's a lot of struggles that we're going through. And you can't figure it out. And this is the reason why God wants you to go to him and say, Papa, Daddy, I can't figure this out. But Dad, I trust that you can. I need your help. This is the type of relationship that God wants with you. You are his child. And so whatever difficulties that you're going through right now, he says you are free at any moment to come and pray to me. I'm always listening. I'm there. I'm there always. It's you that sometimes takes you away from me. But I'm always here for you, son. I'm always here for you, daughter. So then it says, now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. And so because of this, every single one of us that has Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have now belonged to a new family. And that is the family of God. You become an adopted child of God. This is kind of really cool. Uh, I, I didn't know this, but uh, the Greek word translated adoption to theothesia. So the Greek, they, they said adoption was the word theothesia. And heal, back then, it meant son. And uh, thesis, or thea, you know, like if some of you guys have written papers before, you need to to have a thesis statement. A thesis is a position. So when you put thesis together, that word actually means taking the position of a son. And the really cool thing is, the Son of God took our position on the cross of Calvary in order that we might in turn take the position as sons of God. And so God has adopted you and I. So now we can take the position of being an adopted son or daughter of him. And that is the most 
precious position that you can ever have is to be a child of God. And today, as we come here to church, we've gotten a little bit older. And sometimes we've gotten a little bit more jaded. Sometimes we've gotten a little bit more unloving in our life. But today, I want to remind you, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how many hairs are left on your head. It doesn't matter how many white hairs that you have. To God, you are still his precious little child. Children will be the ears of their parents. So that's the truth. Someday, when I'm no longer here, I guess my kids are going to have to fight for my canoes, okay? <laughs> so they're going to inherit those things. So here's the question. What will we inherit from God our Father? When you and I are no longer here, what are we going to inherit? Well, you can't take your house, you can't take your boat, you can't take your bank account, you can't take nothing with you to this next place that you're going to be going. But the really cool thing is, God is saying, because you're my child, what you have inherited is heaven. And with heaven comes eternal life. We are going to be back with our daddy for all of eternity. And at this place, there will be no longer tears, sadness, and grief. But instead, this is going to be a place filled with great joy, peace, and happiness. And that is for all of eternity. And so, this is what happens when you and I say, God, we want Jesus Christ in our life. Then he says, I accept you into my family. And the gift that I have for you is the gift of eternal life. So here's my inspiration for you guys today. Uh, there are many famous people that have adopted children throughout the world. Probably in contemporary times, one of the most famous person that has adopted children that's gotten a lot of publicity is this individual. So her name is Angelina Jolie. You guys have seen her in many, many movies. And so many years ago, Angelina Jolie, she went to Cambodia to film this movie called Tomb Raider. And as Angelina Jolie was spending time in Cambodia, uh, it came to her awareness that in the country of Cambodia, there's actually lots of orphans and lots of orphanages. So she was able to take time away from doing her movie to go and visit some of these orphanages. And as she was making time, to go and spend with these orphans, it came upon her that at that time she didn't have any children, but she loved kids. And so then after doing the movie, uh, she decided to turn back, uh, return back to Cambodia, and she actually uh, adopted a Cambodian child. And so that, that child is the one that is to the right, okay? And so then after that, she went back to, uh, to Southeast Asia, she adopted another child, and then they eventually adopted more children. And so, you know, that's really, really awesome that some of these individuals that have great fame and great uh, wealth, that they're able to make a difference in the life of a few children. And I applaud these individuals for plucking some of these children from complete poverty and, and helping them to, to get a better life. But Angelina Jolie, she could only make a difference really by adopting maybe these three or six kids. That's all she can do. But our God, he doesn't have limits as to how many children he can adopt. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. So, you've been adopted by God. 
And that wasn't by mistake. That wasn't by accident. There's a reason why we're all here today. And we get to unite together to say, one day in glory, all of us will be back home with our Father. What a precious day that's going to be. So with that, um, I want you to think about the message, and I want you to, to ask yourself this question. Do you know that you are a precious child of God? Praise God for allowing us to be His special children. I want you to go into prayer and reflection about that. Do you know that you're a child of God? Praise God for allowing us to be His, spe to be his special children. Please go into prayer for one minute. So here at the end, this is the reason why our sermon question today was, do you know that you are loved so much by God the Father? And I hope that you guys can walk away and remember this. Yes, I am a child of God when I believe in Jesus Christ. And if you do, you are already in his family. And this is the reason why the sermon, what a sermon title for today is, A Child of God, Which You Are. Let us pray together, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Lord God, we thank you so much for your encouraging words today. And the reason why I say encouraging is sometimes, Lord, we're, we're, so, uh, we're so hard on ourselves. When we take a look at our mistakes, when we take a look at the sins in our life, sometimes we look at ourselves and we think that we're so unlovable because sometimes we can't even love ourselves. But thank you for your words in Galatians to remind us today, Lord God, that as long as we believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, we have already entered into your kingdom. Lord God, you already have allowed us to be your child. And yes, we're going to continue to struggle in the flesh. But Lord God, you have already given us this precious gift of eternal life. Lord, no matter what we go through, we just want to thank you for your words of encouragement to say that you will never leave us, but instead, God, you have already adopted us as your precious children. Help us to always remember, Lord God, about the love that you have for us as your children. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's precious holy name. Amen.